Good morning. Glad to have y'all here. Please stand with us. Please stand. We'll go ahead and get service started. Thank you. him all my days and that's kind of what we're going to talk about today in the message of why we were created and the purpose of why God saved us it is 
um, really for his praise and his glory alone. That is the main redeeming purpose. We're thankful we're saved, that God works in us and does things in us. But at the end of the day, the main purpose of our salvation is to bring him glory, praise, and honor. So if you're visiting with us today, we thank you for being with us. As we always say, if this is your first time or your first time in a long time, thank you for being here. Uh, if you have questions about the church, uh, you're more welcome to see me after the service. We'll talk. We'll connect. Uh, we'll obviously social distance the best we can. We're trying to still maintain that. Uh, many of you know that the, the coronavirus, the, as soon as I start talking about it, my mind just goes 100 million different directions. Does yours? Okay, am I the only one that you just start, you don't know some half the time what's true, what's not true, what's, you know, what's fake, what's real. Um, I do know that, that the virus is real and it, it is, it can, you know, cause damage just like any other sickness. Um, but do I believe that it's, it's doing and with the, everything that they're saying, no, I believe there's a fear tactic and there's fear mongering still to hold on. I do believe that. But at the same time, we're going to be respectful of one another. We're going to be mindful. Um, I always get this question. Do you know anybody? I said, yes, I know of uh, quite a few, not personally, not I meant yesterday or the day before, not recently. Uh, but yes, I know some I actually have some family members in Orlando right now in the hospital. Got the text last night that are struggling with it. Um, because they had some heart complications already, and you know what that goes. They're actually literally my own personal family. Had some personal preachers that I knew of, uh, and then church family in Winston. So it actually, I know it is real, but that's why I think if, as long as we do what we're supposed to do like any other time, wash your hands, be respectful of one another, keep your distance, and we're going to continue to do that. But I promise one thing, we're going to keep worshiping God. Amen. Right. I'm just, I'm done with that. We're, we're going to worship God. Um, I said this last week, and just common sense tells me when they show up to Lowe's on Saturday and get everybody out of Lowe's, then we'll stop worshiping God the way, you know, we're not going to stop worshiping God. I'm just going to have some common sense about it. So just be respectful of one another. Mention this. Um, obviously, when we get done the singing portion, we'll send the kids downstairs and appreciate all the workers for that. Uh, appreciate Brother TJ. And I say that because next week we're having a baptism service. So everybody will be in here. We want our children to see that because we have about six kids I think getting baptized along with a few adults. Amen. And so just there's a hunger. Some folks came to Christ here recently. They want to get baptized. You know how we do that here at Terrell. Um, we don't wait till the fourth quarter, you know, the third, fourth quarter or whatever. If somebody's ready to get baptized, we're going to dunk them. Amen. Yep. That's what they did in the scripture. Even in the, they were in a chariot. They were Ethiopian eunuch, got led to Christ. And all of a sudden he said, okay, well, we got to wait till the church meets again. Then we got to fill up the baptistry. No, there's a big old enough hole right here in the side. Let's get dunked. Right, so he got out and Philip baptized him right there in the side of the road. So we're going to honor God, and I've said that before. If you need to get baptized and you need you've been saved and you've come to Christ, you've never followed the Lord in uh, believers' baptism. Hey, would you come talk to me? Remember, it's it's it doesn't save you. You've already been saved by the grace of God. It's just obedience to God, declaring your allegiance and your devotion to Him. And so, if you've never done that. And you're not sure, just please come talk to me next week. Again, the Baptist year will be full and we'll be, we'll be dunking them left and right. Amen. And I say this, and, and if you're a parent and you have a child um, that is getting baptized or everyone gets baptized, I want to give you the privilege of baptizing your children. Amen. The Bible declares that and we see those things. It just doesn't have to happen from the preacher. It happens from people who are saved and following God. That's a prerequisite to baptize somebody. You have to know why you're baptizing. That's clearly seen. It's another disciple. So I think there's such a joy in that. And so I'm excited for next week and what's going to happen. So along with that, you know, once we get everything back into order, whenever that is, um, whatever that looks like, uh, we'll go back to that fourth or last Sunday of the month will be our family worship Sunday. And then uh, until then, you know, we're just going to just navigate through this. So next week, everybody will be up here. We'll be enjoying um, our time together. We'll have, you know, obviously some preaching, but all the baptism in between and just a lot. Have. I'm excited for next week. So, if, uh, again, if you need to get baptized. Please make sure you see me. And if you can't wait till next week and we need to go to the lake, hey, we'll go to the lake. Amen. We'll do that, too. Ask my son. We baptized him in the tub. He couldn't take it no more. And he said, Daddy, I really want to get baptized. So some of you have seen the video where I said, we're just going to get him in the tub. Let's go, son. When's the, I'm not going to tell my son, oh, you want to get, well, let's wait a while. No, let's, you want to be obedient? Let's make it happen. Amen. Right. So let's honor the Lord in that. Don't forget all those things that are going on and happening. Pray one for another. Pray for our country. Uh, happy Independence Day. I don't know about you, but I was thankful for it. At the same time, it just still didn't seem right, did it? There's just still an air lingering over. But God knows what is going on. 
He didn't promise that everything would be right in this world. He just promised he'd walk with us in it. Amen. And so that's what we need to do. So we're going to honor him today, give him glory and praise. And I do thank him for the country that we live in. Uh, we are a truly blessed nation. We truly are. And anybody that complains about our nation, go find somewhere else and they'll be back tomorrow. That's right. I'm just going to be honest. Everybody's like, oh, it's so bad here. I don't get treated right or this doesn't happen. This doesn't happen. Okay. There's the door or the gate. There's the plane. We are blessed people. And we don't need to mock God and we become so, we just sound like a bunch of spoiled brats sometimes, don't we? Oh, I just, I wish I had it better. You ain't going to get much better. You're actually not going to get better. I was reading behind a gentleman said, I've visited 30 different countries. Found out I don't want to be anywhere else. I've been in 30 different countries in my life. This is where I want to be. And so uh, I thank God for the heritage that we have, the good, the bad, the ugly. Amen. Because we always talk about our country. There's a lot of bad. Well, Think about your own family, how much bad is in it. You ever remove all those things out of it? No, you look back and you thank God for it because you learned the lessons. You don't want to remove them. You leave it there for the lessons that we've learned to see where we don't make the same mistakes. Amen? So that's where we need to be. So that's my two cents for our country, and we're going to worship God now. Amen? So let's pray and ask him to bless. And if you'll stand with us, and we'll worship again. Father God, you are faithful. You are good. God, we surrender our hearts and our minds to you in this place today, God. We thank you for the freedoms that you have afforded us in this country, God. Lord, whether all the men who founded our country knew you as Lord and Savior, I know many of them did, and there was many that just knew and understood that the Bible can guide a nation, that your biblical principles could lead us and guide us and help us and we so thank you for that father we thank you for that heritage we thank you for the good father that we've seen for the for those men and women who have given their lives for our freedoms over all these years god thank you for laying them that they laid down their lives for us lord we thank you for the ugly times the ugly times show us father where we don't want to go back to and why we don't want to go that direction lord help us to learn from those dark spots in our history help them help us not to remove them out of our lives God, whatever that looks like, but God, help us to learn from them. They are there to be memorials in our lives to show us that's not the path we want to take. And we so thank you for those times, God. You say, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning you. And as believers, we know that we have dark times in our lives, dry times, that we just know we need you to move. And Lord, we thank you for those times because we look back and we see how you just rescued us and redeemed us. And Lord, just carried us through those times. And Lord, we're not, don't want to be remiss just to praise you for those awesome times in our lives. God, thank you for the meeting of your church today. When there's so many that are still not meeting, so many may be living in fear or they just can't meet today, God. We thank you that you've allowed Terrell Baptist Church to come together, your people to come together another week, Father. Help us to walk in discernment. Help us to walk in wisdom. Help us not to... Uh, to be antagonistic, but help us to be purposeful and worshipful, Father, in what we do. That, Lord, we just want to worship you, God. We just want to be together. Lord, it's so much we see the day approaching, God. We don't want to forsake the assembling of ourselves, God. But we want to be mindful and respectful of one another. Lord, you know that. So help us to do that. Help each one to love one another right and put each other first, God. So, Lord, help us in this place today bring you honor and glory and to worship you. Help us as we sing, Father. May our hearts be devoted to you in everything that we say and do today in the preaching, the giving, the praying, the singing. In Jesus' holy name, everybody said.
Let's pray together. Father God, thank you that you have, as the pastor has already mentioned, brought us together this morning to yet another Sunday. God, help us not to take that for granted. It is obvious in the world that we're living in today that for so many years, for so many things, we have taken for granted. God, as we worship you, help us to know that Lord, it is an honor to be here, to stand, to sit, to raise our hands, to lift our voices to you who deserves praise. Help us, Lord, to worship you with what will be a clean heart and mind. God, for whatever it is that may stand in the way, wash us of those things this morning, Lord. Just take them from our minds, those distractions, the things of the past week, the things of the weeks that are yet to come. And help us to focus on you this morning, giving you just this, even this, just this moment. Lord, in this time together as we fellowship, help us in what minor way that we could give back love to you that you've given to us, God. For we love you because you first loved us, a love undeserved, and yet still undeserved, but given freely. Lord, help us to just to think on that, to sit on that for just a moment. Lord, to remember the blessings of the moment that you woke us up this morning, the moment that got our eyes open. Lord, our, our ears began to hear. And we knew that you were with us from the moment that we took our first breath this morning. You were there. And we praise you, Lord, for that. Help us to lift up and worship to you this morning for those things. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray.
be seated. And children, you are dismissed. Children, you are dismissed. Thank you again for being here. And I want to remind you, man, that is so good. So good. It just makes me want to throw all my notes out and just go at it. But I want to make sure I stick to it. So uh, as the children being dismissed, to remind you, if you're going to give today, appreciate you that continue to give, whether it's online or here at the church. The buckets are at the doors, and we'll remind you at the end, you can drop it in there. We have our security team surrounding them, not because there's chicken in it, but because there's money going to be in it. I got you. I got you. I got you, Sean, back there, Ray, watching y'all. I think they sat next to the bucket because they thought there was chicken in it. (laughs) Okay, that's awesome. It is good to have you here today. Again, if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter number one. Ephesians chapter number 1, and that's where we'll be this morning. Ephesians 1. As I was preparing this sermon and working through it, uh, there's so much. It's one of them passages of Scripture. There's so much taking place. And again, those watching online forgot to uh, thank you for tuning in also. Uh, This passage of Scripture, there's so much things that are happening. When I say this passage... I'm talking about two verses, verses 13 and 14. Verse 13 and 14 is where we will spend our time today. Uh, We will build up to it as we normally do. We'll set the stage of what is happening in Ephesians, specifically Ephesians 1. We see this Trinitarian um, uh, action taking place. When I say Trinitarian, there's this unified trifecta that is going on. You have the Father, the Son, and the Spirit working. You have the Father who is... um, planning, you have the Son who is purchasing, and you have the Spirit who is preserving. And so that right there, I could preach a message just on those three things. Um, it's just con- I just give you those three Ps so you remember them. In the beginning of the book of Ephesians 1, you have a Father who is planning, who has planned and is predestined, is chosen, and there's, uh, there's many conversations about what those verses mean. There's many different theological ideas of how that is implicated within our lives. But I want you to know something. God has created you for Him. God wants all men to be saved. Amen? Not just some men. God, I would say this, I would go out on a limb and say Scripture says God is not willing that any should perish because that's not going out on a limb. That's going out on a verse. The Bible is clear that God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. And if I had a title for this message, it would just be talking about looking ahead. And then why we're looking ahead and what we're looking into, not just ahead, but what we're looking into and what we have to look forward to now and what is to come. So when I say that back at the beginning of the passage, you'll see God is, 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 is working in every one of us. And let's just read it. Let me just read the passage. And we'll start in verse 1. Uh, I'll read through this pretty, pretty quickly, these first few verses, so stay with me because I want you to see the Father, the Son, and the Spirit working and how they're all working hand in hand in your life. Again, remember the Father's planning, the Son's purchasing, and the Spirit is preserving. We'll see these things happening in your life and I literally just get chill bumps thinking about this because I don't know why the, we go to a lot of verses, let me run a rabbit trail real fast because many of you come in here just unassured of your faith. Or you walked in life and there's been times where you just, you're not sure if you're saved, you're not sure if you know Christ and all these things. And this passage of scripture in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 specifically are dealing with us. How God has given us something, not just something, but a person called the Holy Spirit of God to preserve us and to keep us. That is the inheritance that we get. There's inheritance to come, but it's the earnest. We'll see that in a moment. That's a down payment God gives us. And if God gives us a down payment and takes it away, it tells us he's really not much of worth of even being God. You'll see that in a moment because God's not going to give us something and then remove that from us. You'll see what happens. So let's start in verse 1 of Ephesians, and we'll just read through these briefly just to set the stage for verse 13 and 14. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love 
having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. What was the purpose, verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Now we start seeing, we see the beloved, we see the Father in verse 3, how he's planning. He wants all men to be saved. Again, we've talked about this, and a side note, don't want to run this rabbit trail. Again, the theological implications of those verses are diverse. There are diverse implications to you and I as believers. Some would say God has only chosen certain people to be saved, and in that, they must say the same, out of the same breath, God has chosen some people to go to hell. And I would say the Bible does not teach that. The Bible is far from teaching that. God is not willing, again, that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Right? That's not just because in that, and I say that because why did God create man? To glorify him and to worship him. Can man glorify him and worship him? Some would say, yeah, you can glorify them in hell because they're, no, this is not the glorifying and worshiping that God is talking about. When God made you, he didn't make you to glorify him and worship him in hell and burn for eternity. That's not what the Bible talks about. That's not, I, I totally would uh, stand against that theological teaching. But there's some that do. They'll say, well, you know, God chose them. If they're going to get saved, it's only, be, you know, God has to draw them. But if they don't get saved, it's not their fault. Well, hold on a second. So if God doesn't draw them, they don't get saved. But if they don't get saved, it's not God's fault. It's their fault because they're sinners. That's true, they're sinners. But if God don't draw them, then you have to put the cards on God. If God didn't draw them, then they had no choice and no, no hope anyway. You can't, say, you can't speak out of both sides of your mouth. So that's why I'm not going to spend time on that. We have taught through that, those, those teachings, and we're at because it's a prevalent teaching even now. It has risen up. You'll find within uh, Christianity, as I've been studying and learning this and just hearing it, I'm reminded of so often, when we get to, there's ebbs and flows in our culture, especially in America, we teeter-tot on um, what we call charismatic, we, we, on, you know, Charisma, the idea of like we, we, we start to fall into miracles and we worship sign gifts. And then the other side of America will get so deep that we miss the simplicity of God. That we'll get in certain theology and we just, we're hard to find that, that balance in our lives. And so kind of for Terrell, we try to find that balance. You know that. You've been here a lot like, we're not going to lean on this side. Can I believe God does amazing things and still can? Yes. But I'm not basing my beliefs on God and experiences. My belief is based on the word of God and who he says he is. Amen. Not just because I heard something, saw something, you know, it was just, that seemed neat. If I can't go to the word of God and define that and clarify that, then it's, I, I can't hold on to it. I'll just say that's interesting at that point. But the other side is we get so deep in the pool that we miss a simplicity that is in Christ. Oh, if, you, if you're with me, we just try, we try to, we want to be smart and you can't outsmart God, and you can't be smart enough for God. His ways are not your ways. That's not even the message. i got to go on. All right, then you get to verse 7, and we start to see the work. Remember, the planning of the Father, then we see the purchasing of the Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, verse 9, having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. This is God makes and works the plan. Up to this point, you can, if you're taking notes, you would just, God, God makes and works the plan. He knows what he's doing. Verse 11. Now here's where we start to really get into the crux of our passage of verse 13 and 14. And whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. Now, I want you to see again, we've seen the three people that are working, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Now, who's he speaking to? Before we get to verse 13, because verse 13, there's a transition. There's a, there's a people that he starts speaking to differently. Up to this point, we're in the first person, and we would say he's really speaking to the Jews in the culture. He's speaking to his people. You understand that from verse really 3 through 12 when he says us and we. You see these things taking place. And then you get to verse 13. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth now we're in the second person now he's speaking to a, another group we would say and we understand the passage and there's more implications and things taking place but at the end of the day speaking to the gentiles 
We first trusted Christ. He came to us first. We understand that to his own. We know, but now we all get in this who you also trusted because there was a portion in the sect of Ephesus and in the church at Ephesus that if you were a Gentile, there was, there was you know, I wasn't a Jew. We kind of live that today, right? There's something that's been going on beyond, and I'll use this only because I would use it any other time even if we weren't in the culture that we were in, right? Black and white, that whole mentality of one affords the other, or the other one does whatever, that has been way before, there's been something way before that. It's called Jews and Gentiles. Way before black and white even existed. And again, I would say that even if we weren't in the culture we're in. I said that 10 years ago. I'm still saying it now, so I'm not using that just to, but I'm saying it because it makes sense. We, we get it. Before we had that, we had Jews and Gentiles. Gentiles thought because I wasn't a Jew, I wasn't good enough. Because the Jews, there's always been hating going on. Both sides, Forever. I mean both sides. I don't even know what both sides are, like multiple sides, all different sides. There's always been hating, always will be. If you have people, there's going to be hating, amen? Because people equals joys and pleasures. No, people equal problems. How many of us know that? Get married and you find out. Right? Because you get married and everything, everybody gets along and everybody's good, right? The honeymoon period lasts for the next 20 years, doesn't it? And y'all would say, you're... You have words, right? You're looking at me. I see the grin, especially the husbands. You're like you're looking, you're hoping your wife's not looking at you. No, that's life. There's joys, there's there's burdens, there's blessings in there. It's up and down. So when you have people, you will always have problems. Amen. Mark that down. But not at the same time, just with people, we get problems, but also with people, we get blessings and we get encouragement. If it wasn't for one another, we wouldn't have the things that we have when it comes to enjoying life together. Amen. So we know that. But at this point, we know that there was a hating always going on, specifically in the Jews. How many of us have grown up in a Baptist, a Baptist culture, or not just a Baptist, a Christian culture? And I would say Christian culture because it's not just subject to the Baptist, that you get to a point that, you know, Jews are special. How many of you had that mindset? Okay, most of you, like, you're afraid. And it's okay. Jews have this thing, like, they have an upper hand on us. The Bible declares they do not have an upper hand on us. The Bible declares there's no difference between Jew nor Greek nor Gentile. We're all one in Christ. And to get to Christ, you all have to believe the same. The Jew has to believe the same way we believe. Right? It's the idea of saying a Messianic Jew. Like, it's the idea of saying I'm an American Christian or whatever. No, no, you're a Christian who is an American. You're a Christian who is a Jew. Right? At the end of the day, what defines you should be first. I'm not a plumber who's a Christian I'm a Christian who's a plumber amen like that's what should define you whatever it is you do your Christianity should define what you do not what you do should shouldn't define your Christianity so your heritage shouldn't define your Christianity your Christianity should define that and if whatever it is your heritage is doesn't define and doesn't line up with Christianity then it's not worth living anyway amen tree right is that not where we're at we have to get back to that place My Christianity has to be my identity. Who I am in Christ is my identity, not where I come from, what I look like, you know, whatever side of the track, whatever that looks like. My identity is in Christ, not those things. So I'm not, but I'm, here's a side note. Don't go away here. Pastor Chad, don't care where I came from. No. Where you came from is important. Your heritage is important. It, It gives the universality of the gospel. It gives diversity. We used to know the term university. It doesn't mean this anymore. University means unity and diversity. How many universities have unity and diversity now? None, really. Like, let's just be honest. It doesn't exist. You go to a Baptist theological seminary, you'll find out real fast. There's not even a whole lot of unity and diversity there. They're still wanting to create it. That's why I don't like call them sem- uh, cem- I call, I, now I'm saying cemeteries. They're seminaries, but I often call them cemeteries because I found out you go to the Bible college like I did, or, and they're great. If you're not careful, they will rob you of your zeal and your passion and your fire, and it'll be gone. And you'll come out wanting to, they'll want you to be like, you have to be very careful. So there are some out there doing a great job. There's some good universities, some good Bible college seminaries doing things. But in general, we have adopted this mindset, there is no unity and diversity. We want you to look like me, talk like me, act like me. Is that not the America we live in right now? Whether you want to call it socialism or Marxism, communism, whatever it is, or republicanism or right wing, left wing, everybody wants everybody to look like their their affiliation. And we're missing the unity that is in the diversity. 
But that is the beauty of the gospel. The gospel brings unity and diversity. It brings also, I'm not saying you shouldn't uh, forget where you came from. But if all you're doing is talking about where you came from, what you look like, how much money you have or don't have, you got a problem. You have an identity problem. You have a pride problem. That's what you have. Because in Christ, your heritage afforded you nothing. Ask the Apostle Paul when he said, I was the Hebrew of the Hebrews. I was a Pharisee of the Pharisee. I mean, I was it. I mean, I had everything you can imagine. I was Paul. Look at me. I'm great. I'm mighty. I was smart. I studied under Gamaliel. I had a lot of things going on. But you know what? None of that afford anything. So that's what I say today. It's all dung. Paul said it's all dung. It's all a bunch of pile of poo. That's what it is. To know Christ, to everything else compared to knowing Christ. So like when I hear a believer that's purple, yellow, brown, black, white, doesn't matter, and they start talking about, this is my color, this is where I came from, my heritage. I'm like, you're totally missing it. It ain't about that. It ain't about that at all. Now, if you talk about Jesus first, and then we bring that into the conversation, that's great. But if Jesus isn't your identity and your heritage and where you came from, what you look like is, and that's what you're harping on, you got a problem. You need to go home and die to yourself. That's what you need to do. You need to be like Paul and say, well, I guess ain't that great. Listen, side note, I get it. I understand what's going on. It's Yankee and Southerners, amen? They finally got a laugh. You ain't getting nothing out of you, but as soon as I say Yankee, Southerners, it's on. First church I was at, every time I walk in a room, this one guy was like, I knew I'd smell something. And I remember, what are you talking about? He said, I smell a Yankee. Right? Like, listen, I was born on the Mason-Dixon line. I had a choice. And I came the right way. Amen? That's what I say. I came the right way. But it still exists. More than racism in the sense of that sense, Yankee Southerners, it exists. The war is still alive to some of you. Listen, I wasn't in the war had nothing to do with it. I can't help I came from the north, okay? Sorry. You know, but I, I didn't fight in it. We weren't against each other. But it still exists in some people's mind. I want you to know the Jew is no better than you. Do they have a purpose? Does God have a purpose and plan for a specific people group of a Jewish nation and people in, in a, at the end times we find? Yes, there's a land. There's a, but at, it doesn't make them better. Just because I'm a preacher of the gospel, stand behind a pulpit and a pastor, doesn't make me better than you. I'm not... Nobody else, if you're a lay man in here, you're just as much a man of God that I can be a man of God. We have this hierarchy that we have built, and that's, uh, it's atrocious and it's wrong. This doesn't work without us working together. I can't stand in a pulpit and preach to an empty room thinking I'm a pastor. That doesn't work. But at the same time, a man of God is somebody who's fully devoted to Christ, honoring him and walking with him in truth. That's a man of God. That's a woman of God. Now, I understand there's different responsibility and there's things that come with, me, come with this position. I understand that. But it doesn't make it better and it doesn't make it more important. It just has different responsibility with it. Are you with me? So be very careful with that. We've done a horrible job with that where there's like Pastor Deacon's Church. No, it's Pastor Deacon's Church. We're all in the same playing field. We all have to work together. We can't function. We all have our roles to play. Amen? It's no different in a home. Husband and wife. Are they equal under God? Yes. But do they have different functions and role? Yes, they do. One leads, one follows, and they picture to the church, and you have children. You know, children are definitely down there. Amen? Just kidding. Make sure you pay attention. They're not. Wouldn't be a father if it wasn't for my children. So I can't I can say, well, I'm daddy. I'm big and bad. Nope. You wouldn't be a daddy if it wasn't, God didn't give you me. So we're all in the same playing field. We all have purpose. and So i got to go on. Somebody say go on, right? I'm going to get stuck on something. So now we're, you see what is taking place within the culture. Now you understand why Paul in verse 13 is dealing with this gospel presentation. They understand it because these Ephesians who were Gentiles were probably struggling. And we know with all the other writings of Paul that they were struggling in their faith. That I'm not a Jew. Can I be, am I going to be okay? How do I know? How do I know that I know God? How do I know I'm going to go be with God? Right? Because I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a Jew. I don't get it. I'm not sure how that works. Well, Paul solidifies this conversation in the beginning. And we know what he does. And I want to say this first. When you go see these two phrases we go out, there's going to be especially the Spirit. You have the Spirit and the promise. The Spirit of promise. And you're going to see what these are. The Spirit is what proves the work of God in our lives and just the work of God in general. Whenever you read the Old Testament into the New Testament... 
Whenever God touched something, His Spirit moved upon it. Every time. When Jesus was getting baptized, everybody's like, you, you watch movies and you see John the Baptist standing there and he looks up and he sees Jesus. Right? Is that what the Bible teaches? No. When did he know he was Jesus? When he baptized him and then the Spirit moved. And so even at the confirmation and even at the affirmation, that's what we're going to deal with in a moment, of Jesus' ministry, the Spirit moved. The book of Acts, there was the moving of the Spirit. Samson, the moving of the Spirit. The cloud in the wilderness was the Spirit of God hovering over them over and over again. So when somebody says, I think God worked, and there is no fruit of the Spirit of God anywhere near that, that's not God. Because God's work is always affirmed and proved by the work of the Spirit. Now, we have done a horrible job. I'm just, I'm, I'm more like teachy today, so just bear with me. Because there's a lot happening. I, I tell you, there was a lot in these two verses in this passage. Because we've done a horrible job within our culture that we've allowed certain theological mindsets and teachings and doctrines rob, rob us of the Spirit of God. We're so, how many of us growing, growing up, you're afraid to just talk about, I'm controlled, but when you say, I'm con I need to be controlled by the Spirit of God, what's your first thought go to? Many of us. It's either handling snakes, speaking in tongues, or doing something else, going all these different directions. And that's many people's first thought. And we've allowed false teaching to rob us of what that is. Right? And we talked about this. Some of you say tongues. What's tongues? Like Everybody's like, it's the, it's the language of angels. It's an unknown language. When you read the Bible, when you ever see the word tongues, or if you ever see, the word, uh, if you ever see an angel speak, I will tell you, you understand everything that they say. There's never an unknown time in the Bible that an angel speaks, that you didn't know what they say. They're like this heavenly language. And you read the Apostle Paul, and he talks about, let us speak with tongues. He's not talk, the, the whole purpose isn't even talking about speaking in this tongues. The issue is love. The issue is charity. And the picture of what he gives there is going on. But we make, and we harp on this thing, like if you don't do this, if you don't speak this way, then you're missing something out on God. No, you're not. You're not missing out on God. The speaking of tongues was just an unknown language. Like, we understand this. When they came down, I don't, I don't even want to teach on this. I'll do this maybe on a Sunday morning sometime. We've done it in a Bible study. But we've done it when the, in the book of Acts and Pentecost. Right? Everybody known and they understood in their own language. That was a tongue. It was their own language. That's what it was. There was interpreters. If somebody comes in speaking um, Chinese or French in here today, I promise you, I'm hoping I'm going to need some help in here today. Miss Kyung's in here. Miss Kyung, I would need your help, right? Like, understanding Japanese, I have no clue, right? Am I, am I right? Do you understand Japanese pretty well? Like, I would need her. Somebody came up here and like, Miss Ki oh, I say Miss Kyung. Miss Yoko, I'm sorry. Miss Yoko, she's looking at me like I'm crazy because I said her, didn't say her name. Miss Yoko would have to come up here and interpret for me because I have no clue. That, that's all that is. It's in language, but does she understand the language? Because she's blessed of God, that, but she also grew up in the culture. She knows what that is. She can understand it. So be careful. We don't allow people to rob us of the Spirit of God. Wrong teaching and false teaching. Are you with me on that? We have. We're so afraid. Each one of you need to walk in the Spirit of God. You are commanded by the Word of God. Not to be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit of God. Right? Be not drunk with wine where is in excess, but be ye filled. Like you're to walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit of God and the knowledge of God. We do that in accordance with the Word of God. That's not just all those things just aren't granted at the moment of salvation. You are granted all of the Holy Spirit of salvation. Now how much you tap into that salvation is on you. We tap into that salvation with the Word of God and walking in communion with Him in fellowship. That's how it takes place. We'll talk about that later. So now, again, we're in here now. We're in verse 13. We're going to see this. I just got to get to my notes. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth. What is going on in this, in this part, first portion? And if you're taking notes, you're going to write 13a. Normally I don't do this, but you're going to break down each verse in two parts. They have two parts to them. Verse part of verse 13 is, Whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation. So now Paul is laying and he's affirming or he's validating their faith. That's what's happening here in verse 13. Verse 13 is the validation of their faith or the affirmation of their faith. I want to make sure you know that you know that you're saved. I want to tell you, you remember what happened, and I want to declare that today to you. Next week we're, we're having baptisms, and it's going to be great. But I understand this. Every time we, we start talking about salvation, there's many of you 
who may under, not have a true grip, grip, a grip of salvation understand what that is. We live in a really um, easy praying, easy, 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 I can't even talk, evangelical time of Christianity where you say this little prayer ditty and you can get into heaven. No, it's not a prayer ditty that gets you into heaven, right? It's a belief. He tells them what you did, right? In whom you also trusted, what went first? Trusted or the hearing? Read it. In whom you also trusted after that, you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation. So faith come by hearing, and hearing come by the word of God, associated with the belief. So somebody must hear the word of God. Nobody can be saved apart from the word of truth. Human cleverness, persuasiveness, or eloquence cannot save souls. Nor can oratory in the pulpit or artistry in the choir. God has not promised to bless programs or performances. He always blesses his word. The witness of the Spirit is to the Son of God by means of the Word of God. Along the way, God uses other vehicles, He does, but His chosen channels, His chosen channels for sharing the gospel, for bringing the light to an individual or to a person in our world, and to the soul and conviction of their conscience, are His church and the saints that share His Word. That's His primary purpose. God's primary means and vehicle of sharing the gospel is you and I. That is God's primary purpose. But we know how God will share his truth. He would declare to somebody, that's why in Romans 1, everybody's without excuse, are they not? The pygmy in Africa, and I feel for him. I do. You know, the, the, in the jungles of China, or wherever it be, they're all, I mean, again, you're like, well, how are they going to get saved? The Bible says without excuse, God will make himself known to them. I trust the sovereignty and the, and the power of God. He will make himself known. How does he do that? Through creation. Did he not, like, I don't know if I agree with that. Well, read the book of Job. He got a whole book that he, Job believed in a God based on creation. That's what it was. Job didn't have the written word of God. The, the spirit of God wasn't hovering in the sense of living within them, right? But at that point, Job knew there was a God because of creation. He understood there was a God, and he worshipped that God. You will find throughout history men and women who worship God because it's in us to worship. You will go to those jungles, you will go to those places, and you will find what? People worshipping what? The moon. They'll worship the sun. They'll worship trees. They'll worship whatever they can find because it's in us to worship. God wrote his law upon our hearts to worship him and to glorify him in the book of Romans teaches. So we, nobody's without excuse. The Gentiles, Paul brings them back to that point. You've heard the word because you heard the word, not just the word, but the word of truth. We live in a world where people want to talk about, well, there's multiple truths. There is not multiple truths. There's one truth. Even though math in your uh, educational systems might say 2 plus 2 is no longer 4, it could be 5, it could be 6, if you, know, you worked it out somehow that you got there, or like your spelling. As long, and when I heard this, you can spell love, as long as it sounds right, L-U-V. No, that's how they text it, right? But now that's how kids spell it, but it's okay, and we, like, we don't mark an X on it because we don't want to hurt their feelings. God, help us. And we wonder what's wrong with our culture and our young generation why they don't want to give in to God. Because we have not declared truth to them. We're allowing them to live a lie. So when they come to God and they wonder, we tell them that's truth, that Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except by me. Well, I don't know. Maybe there's another way around it because, you know, I can spell love however I want it. I can, you know, two plus two can equal whatever I want it to be and on down the line, right? However I want to do it, I want, no, that's not how life works. You know, participation trophies are nice, but that's not real life, is it? Right? That's not real life. They need to be earned. They need to be something given. Now, there's nothing, it's okay, make them feel warm and fuzzy inside, but at the end of the day, I do not want a participation trophy. Like, my son might get one, or my kids, or whatever. I'm like, you know, that's great, but son, you know what? It's second place, it's not first. Like, oh, don't know. I'm going to be honest with them. This is real life. There's real life. When we come to Jesus, it's real life, but that's where we live. And so this mentality, and that's a whole nother conversation, but the social construct that's been created within our minds and within our young people's heads, it is crazy. You know how many uh, parents talk to me all the time? I'm struggling. You know, my, my, my kid, you know, the, the thinking, you know, they're not thinking anything like I'm thinking. Well, what's impacting them? I promise you it's not you then. It's their phones. It's the technology that is driving them, and they're believing. Somebody, you know, like, they're talking about, like, they just... They're not conservative like me. 
Well, what are they listening to? Well, they got their friends that are marching with this, and they got their pride this, and they got this they're standing for, and women's rights and everything else. And we wonder why they go to the church and we have young people struggling why, you know, to think why abortion is wrong. Because it's not because they've grown up in a society to think this is their life. This is your body. You can do what you want with it. No, it's not. You didn't create yourself. God created you. God made you and formed you in your mother's womb as a precious gift. And you've been given this temple to use for his glory and purpose and not to use against him. Oh, but that sounds mean. Well, life isn't fair. (laughs) Okay, let's go on. Again, there's more there. Got to move through this. So they heard the word of truth. They've been saved by the gospel. Ye also, you'll see now he's speaking to the Gentiles. And then we get to the second part of verse 13. In whom also after that ye believed... Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. That Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit was promised before in the book of Acts. We'll see this in a moment. So let's just walk through this briefly, uh, real fast. The Spirit proves, again, we talked about God's work. But not just God's work, the Spirit's purpose also is to guide us to heaven. John chapter 16, verse, um, really verse 5, 5 through 16, you know the story, you know the setting. Jesus is talking to his disciples. He said, you know what, I'm going ha- to go away, but when I go away, there's somebody coming better, and they're like, you're crazy. Who can be better than somebody that raises the dead to life or heals a lame person or you know, makes the deaf to speak, and the, I mean the dumb to speak and the <laughs> deaf to speak, the, the deaf to hear or the dumb to speak? Who can be better than that? Jesus says, the paraclete, the comforter. The one who's going to walk beside you and hold your hand in life. Name is the Holy Spirit. They're going to come and he's going to come and live inside of you and work in you and guide you and specifically guide you to heaven. Because we all need that guide to get to heaven because there's a lot of things between us and heaven in there trying to throw us off track. There's a lot of things going off between now and there. I love that song, Come Thou Fount. You know, Come Thou Fount, when it talks about that, bind me like a fetter. Buy me like a fetter because I'm prone to wonder. Do you know you're prone to wonder? I'm prone to wonder. If, it's, if I'm not careful and I'm not literally strapped up, Lord, handcuff me to your love. That's the picture of that fetter. Handcuff me to your love because if you don't, I will be prone to wonder. I will not be doing what you've called me to do with my life. I'll be not sharing your love and grace and purpose in people's lives. I'll be doing what I want to do. How many of y'all find your heart wondering sometimes? You, God, just take the glorious handcuffs of heaven and attach me to yourself, please. Because if not, I will start to walk away from you. That's what the the writer of that song, that's the thought, how our hearts are so easily swayed away. But thank be to God we have the spirit of promise that is promised to us that not just is a promise, but was the promise. Was the promise of the comforter. And you'll see this continues to go on. That promise is what? It is confidence and assurance. Most importantly, of God's presence. The word promise speaks of confidence and assurance. When daddy promises you something, it ain't like God. I say that because some of you got good daddies. And I say good daddies relatively compared to earthly circumstances, not God, okay? Because there's none to do with good, no, not one. So I understand. Some of you got daddies, they make a promise, they do it. Some, now, I, won't, I, I, won't, I really don't want to use the husbands, throw husbands in there, right? But some of you do have decent husbands that say, hey, I promise you I'll take care of it, and they don't wait three weeks. They knock it out, and they get it done. Or they don't take care of everybody else's stuff before yours. We know how that goes, right? Like, it's so easy. I don't know why. Listen, ladies, I, side note, I apologize. I, I don't know why we struggle with that. We need to do better, husbands, that we always take care of everything else, be, of other people, before we do ourselves. Our wives have been asked us to fix something for three months, and somebody calls us, and we show up on that Saturday, we're there. Am I the only one that knows that to be true about us? God help us, amen, that we fix that. Okay, maybe, sorry, <laughs> What's that? that's funny. Uh, we need to do better with that. Because more importantly, here's the picture we're representing to our children. Remember, fathers, you're a representation of God in the home. When we make a promise and we don't keep it, you know what that's bank, they're looking at God thinking God doesn't keep promises. It is instilled in our children to look at us as a representation of God. And when we don't represent God well in the home, especially when we make promises we don't keep, and we tell them God makes promises and doesn't break them, you know how hard it is for them to believe that? You know how hard it was for me to believe that? That, you know, God, I could trust God when I couldn't trust one man in my life growing up. Even my mom, you know, remarried and he became, again, I call him dad. He's my father. He raised me and provided for me and protected me. 
you know, we struggle, you know, we're going through that because I'm trying to develop a relationship with my biological father right now at the same time. You know, we talked about that. And so I'm going through all those emotions and things in my own personal life and working that out because I grew up knowing that I didn't have confidence in men in my life. My mom was always there, but men weren't. And so when this man came into my life and said he wanted to be my dad and adopt me and I took on his name, I'm like, oh, that's nice. But he'll end up walking away, not be around and he, but he realized, I realized that he wanted to be, and then we had to have, like, you know, we got into it, and then we had to go sit with our pastor, and he helped us work through things, because I realized God makes, God's not like my earthly father. God's not like earthly men. He makes promises, and he keeps them. He doesn't break them, because then he would cease to be God. So when God makes this promise of the Spirit, he will keep it. We'll see why he keeps it, because he gives, it, gives us the reason in the next verse of why he basically, he can't break it. It's not going to happen because he would cease to be God and go back on his word. So the gift of the Holy Spirit is God's seal on the document of salvation. I just want to read this to you so I don't just get sidetracked. We, we, he has signed it. We have signed it. It's the old Stevie Wonder song, but Stevie Wonder, I, I had to say it because it's just in my head, sign, seal, deliver, right? Like, has nothing to do. Like, that was actually... Unassurance. That wasn't even assurance. That was somebody who was insecure in the song. It wasn't even a security song. But that was the picture. You know, that was the mind. That's what you find. It's been signed and it's been sealed. It's been delivered. I know your mind's going to go to it as soon as I said it. So I might as well just say it. Right? That's the picture you have here. It's been signed with salvation. It's been sealed by the Holy Spirit and will be delivered by the Holy Spirit. You'll see at the purchase possession. We'll get there. So the agreement is sealed. The contract of unconditional salvation goes into effect and is binding on all parties. Since God does all the doing, no failure on our part, all failure having been anticipated long, long ago, can invalidate the contract. So no failure on our part can invalidate the contract. It can't be broken. No failure on our part because who's the one that seals the contract? God. That's what it says. The Holy Spirit. Can I break the seal of the Holy Spirit? You're like, well, here comes the conversation. You, you one of them once saved, always saved? Yes, I'm one of them ones who, if you're truly saved, repented of, repented of your sins and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and been cleansed and washed in the blood through the forgiveness of your sins, absolutely you're saved. Because it's not your sealing, it's not your saving, it's eternal life, it's not temporary life. Right? When I, the Apostle Paul over and over again says, I've been given the life of Jesus. And is Jesus' life eternal or temporary? Does Jesus have eternal life or a temporary life? And if his life is my life now, what do I have? Eternal life. Can I lose Jesus' life? Can Jesus ever lose his life? No, so that means I can't lose my life because it's not my life, it's his life. Read the Apostle Paul in the teaching. No longer do I live by my life, but I live by the, I live by the life of the Lord Jesus Christ who saved me and gave himself for me. It's clear, but you and I are not used to having people love us like that. That's why we think we can lose our salvation, because people are so fickle in our lives. People come and go, don't they? They're with you, they're not with you. God never leaves you nor forsakes you. He will not let you down. He will bind you and hold you for eternity. So the contract is not binding upon your part, it's binding upon his part. Because why? It's his seal. You'll see that in a moment. So... Um, John Phillips says it this way, I love it. In this age, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, sealed not to escape. You've got to understand this. We're not sealed to escape life's perils and persecutions, but sealed against any possibility of losing our salvation after we respond to the word of truth, which is the gospel of salvation. Once we respond to the word of truth and believe on the gospel, then we can be saved. That's why I love in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 5. Listen, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away. Like it doesn't go away, it doesn't go anywhere. Reserved in heaven for you. So you that have been redeemed, bought by the blood of Christ, you've been saved, there's an inheritance waiting on you that's not going anywhere. Like, no matter what you do, you have something waiting on me. This isn't on earth. Another illustration, again, just to give it to you. This isn't a family on earth when a grandparent dies and everybody fights over everything and you lost everything because you find out they took you out of the will and now you're mad and Thanksgiving's awkward, Christmas is awkward, everything's awkward because nobody, come on now. That's why I love when I hear some people just like, they have a lot of money and at the end of it all, they really barely give anything to the family. They give it all away because they know their kids will fight over it. 
And then you see the kids run around pouting, but nobody can be mad. Like they, they want to be mad at each other, but they can't be mad at each other because you didn't get the money, I didn't get the money. Dad's an idiot. Like it's all you say, like really, is that where you're going? Like you see it, it's horrible. It is horrendous that what we fight over. Anyway, that's not the message. I want to go on. So inherits incorruptible. Watch in verse 5, it says in 1 Peter 1, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. We're in greatly rejoice, though now, and he writes all those things that you can be confident and assured of your salvation. And because of God and the power of God in your life keeping you, you don't have to worry about problems and persecutions and perilous times. He says, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if you need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. That the trial of your faith, I love it. These people, these doctor spit furthers who get on TV and on the internet and everywhere now, and they talk about come to Jesus and everything gets better and you'll be healed, you'll get money. Bunch of crap, excuse my language, I shouldn't say it like, word, like that's horrible. That's ridiculous. It's, lot, it's straight from the pit of hell. That's where that's from. Because when I come to Jesus, 1 Peter teaches me that everything don't get better. Hey, get your left. We were talking about this other day. Your best life now. This is my best life now. Heaven's must be, you know, I don't know what heaven's like then. It must not be heaven. Right? Read the book. You know what I'm talking about. Joel Steen or whatever it is. Your best life now. Like, no, this is not my best life now. My best life is to come in eternity. Amen. You know, if this is my best life now, I'm, I'm just done. I'm done. I'm giving up. Paul talks about that. Anyway, go on. So that the, if you need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations, knowing because you've been saved and the salvation, you're being sanctified, verse 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why are you being tried today to bring praise and glory to God? Like verse 12 of Ephesians 1 says, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. We are saved to bring glory to God and for God to get glory. You're not just saved to be redeemed. and to Again, the ultimate purpose is, yes, we have a relationship with God, but even bigger than just a relationship with God and receiving the blessings of God. There's something even greater. It's for God to get glory. Jesus came to bring God glory. Gee, everybody's like, well, Jesus would have came if he, if he only would have saved one soul. No, Jesus would have came if nobody got saved because it was about his Father. It was about the glory of his Father. You're awesome, like, you're awesome in the creation of God, but you're not that great. Like, we always use that term, Jesus would have came if it just one soul. Lie, he would have came if there was no souls that got saved. Because his Father was that amazing, and he loved his dad, and he wanted to honor him. But aren't you glad we get saved? And we get, we get part of the redemption process. But I promise you, Jesus still would have came even if not one person in this world ever would have got saved because he came out of obedience to the Father because he's showing us how we're to live out of obedience to the Father and glory to God. We're not getting saved so we can get a bed of roses and get all these extra benefits and get out of hell free cards. No, we're getting saved to bring glory to God. The same reason Jesus came and the same reason to save us, we're to live for him in that all praise and glory and honor to his holy name. So we're sealed. That, what a word. It, it suggests a, a finished transaction and absolute assurance of eternal security. The gift of the Holy Spirit is God's seal on the document of salvation. That's what he says here in Ephesians 1. That's what he's saying. This seal is on. Why do we know that? I want to read it to you here in a second. Why we know that based upon Scripture. The agreement is sealed. The contract of unconditional salvation goes into effect and is binding on all parties. Since God does all the doing, no failure on our part. We've seen this. What is this document? The document that was thereby officially under the authority of the person whose stamp was on the seal. There's four primary truths that are signified and stated by this seal according to Scripture. In the Old Testament, we have Daniel 6, 1 Kings, Jeremiah, and Esther. What are those four things represented? There's other things that you can line in there for time's sake. It's number one, there's security. If there was a seal based on it, 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 it brought security to the seal and to the document. That you know that it can't be broken. Because if you were to break the seal, what was going to happen to you? We know what happened. You're going to die. That seal should be unbroken once it gets to the receiver. Come on now. You hear what I'm saying? You've been sealed. You're going to remain unbroken until you get to the one who's supposed to be getting it. Why do we know that? Because it talks about the purchased possession. You've been purchased. You're the possession of the Father. You've been saved. So you are sealed until the day of redemption. 
Who can break that seal? The only person who can break the seal is the one who sealed it and the one who's supposed to receive it. And even then, the one who sealed it, there had to go through a rigmarole of stuff to get to that point. But the only way that seal can be broken is that the one who gets it that receives it. You'll see that in a second. So it's security, authenticity. It was real. It was affirmed. You know where it's coming from. It's not a fake. Ownership, security, authenticity, ownership. This belongs to me. The seal of Jesus Christ has been placed upon you by the Holy Spirit of God. So when you get in front of God one day, and when you die and you stand in front of the Father, you've been sealed. He looks, oh, you're good. You're stamped with approval. You get in. You've been sealed. There's ownership. Who owns you? Who's, who sealed you? The Holy Spirit of God. And then there's the authority of the seal. So the security, the authenticity, the ownership, and the authority. The Holy Spirit is given as a pledge, as a promise of the believer's future inheritance and glory. And that's what you'll see in this, that next portion. The Christian received the Spirit, not after, but when he believes in Christ the Savior. The sealer is Jesus. The seal is the Holy Spirit. So it was a picture of identification and ownership. Protection and provided by the owner. When a person becomes a Christian, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in his life. The life in Jesus Christ is different because the, the Spirit of God is now within. He is therefore to empower us and equip us for ministry and function through the gifts He has given us. The Holy Spirit is our helper and advocate. He protects and encourages us. He also guarantees our inheritance in Jesus Christ. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and of children heirs and also an heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, Romans 8. The Spirit of God is our securing force and our guarantee. When the Holy Spirit seals believers, he marks them as God's divine possessions. Who from that moment on, and on entirely and eternally belong to him. The Spirit seal declares the transaction of salvation as divinely official and final. Once the Holy Spirit seals you, it's official and final. It's done. So yes, do I believe when you're, full, when you're truly saved by the grace and mercy of God, are you fully, securely saved for eternity? Yes. Because nobody can break that seal but the one who's being delivered to. Who's it being delivered to? Verse 14. You can't break that seal. You're incapable of breaking that seal. Which is the earnest, the spirit of promise, which is the earnest, we're right here at the end, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, you and I who are saved, unto the praise of the glory. Until that day we stand before him, until we are delivered over, then it could be there. But until that point... The seal is unbroken. The Holy Spirit, the Christian receive, is called the earnest of the Spirit. I want to read this to you. 2 Corinthians 1.22 says, Who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. 2 Corinthians 5.5 5, Now he hath wrought us in the selfsame thing as God, who also hath given us the earnest of the Spirit. The sealing of the Holy Spirit guarantees, that's the earnest, the benefits of our salvation. As a person might seal an envelope to guarantee its enclosures, the Holy Spirit is a seal to the believer and is also a down payment of his commitment to, the, to someday give him all other things God has promised. The Holy Spirit is not only the seal, he is also the earnest. He is not the proof of our position in Christ. He is also the pledge of our possessions in Christ. He not only confirms our faith, he also confirms our future. This is where the affirmation, verse 13 was the affirmation of our faith. Verse 14 is the affirmation of our future. Right here, stay with me. I'm reading this so I don't run anywhere else. You've got to finish this. I mean, I could sit here, like I said, for another hour. One day we will do that and you, some will just have to walk out. Like, I just don't, I can't walk away from the scriptures halfway through today. I have to finish verse 14. The Holy Spirit is not only the seal. Again, he's the earnest. So we do not use, again, we don't often hear this word. Where do you hear the word earnest at now? Where's often that word used? Nobody wants to say it? Anybody buy or sell a house here recently? Right? In, in, real, in realty, this is where it's at. You'll see, we don't hear it much. It's not often used in our ordinary conversation. I love how one puts this. But, and here's the story they tell. But real, real estate agents still use it in some business transactions. This, this couple is coming back from, moving from England to the States. He said, when my, when my wife and I first came to the United States, we wanted to buy a house. The real estate agent showed us a number of homes, and we finally found a suitable one in our price range. We made our offer. And then the agent said, I will need some earnest money. We had never heard that expression before and asked him what it meant. 
he said, I'm going to take your offer to the owner of the house. Listen, I want you to figuratively listen as I talk things. You already know what the Holy Spirit has sealed you, and he's going to carry you all the way to the day of redemption, to the glorification of your souls. Now watch. He said, I'm going to take your offer to the owner of the house so that he can decide if he wants to accept it. And you imagine he's telling this to a preacher too. I would need your check for $1,000 to show him that you are in earnest about this offer. Your check will prove to him that you really mean business and that you are not going to back out halfway through the deal. The check I wrote that day was not for the full amount of the offer. In fact, it was only a token amount. I would have to pay much more money when it was the time to complete the deal. Similarly, the Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance as Christians. God gives us the Holy Spirit to each believer as evidence that he is in earnest about our salvation. That one day he's fully going to complete the possession. He's fully going to complete it. Amen. One day we're going to fully get there and it will no longer have to worry about am I going to get it or not. Remember the backdrop is struggling. Am I really saved like if I trust in Christ? Yes. If you trusted in Christ you are sealed until the day of redemption. The purchased possession is here. It's you and I. He means business. He's not backing out. And there's much more to come. The great transaction is underway, but it is not yet completed. That's why we call we're in the sanctification process. We're in the transaction period. We are being trans like we are working through it. There's things we're working in and out. That's why we need the Holy Spirit of God because there's going to be a lot of things get between us and heaven, right? And I need the Holy Spirit to guide me and lead me throughout this process in life because there's a whole lot of junk that's going to try to get my attention between here and heaven. And I need the Holy Spirit to lead me and guide me. I need the Holy Spirit to lead me, guide me in my home, in my church, in life in general, the job because there's going to be a whole lot of things that are going to mess us up. Amen. So I need the Holy Spirit more than ever in my life because the devil, myself, are going to try to get thrown off track. And I need that Holy Spirit's guidance in my life. So it's underway, this transaction. We are still waiting for the rest of it. Still waiting for the rest of it. Remember that day you walked in your home? I've never owned a home in my life. There's reasons I would love to own a home and reasons why I haven't owned a home, but I've never owned a home. I'm about to be 40, and then um, <laughs> about to be 40, and I'm like, some people are like, you never owned a home like I've, like I've missed out on something. There's something more important than me. It's my salvation. I haven't missed out on anything. But at the same time, I know the privilege of owning a home in the world that we live in, right? Y'all get it. It's, there's a whole there's, there's so many things I know. I, I mean, I really don't know, but I hear about it. Nothing binds me and holds me here. I'm free to move and go and to live, but at the same time, it's nice to have you know, something there, an investment. I get it. I understand that. I've just never been in a place in my life where I could ever own a home. I just never have. Never been financially in a place, so I wouldn't know what that is, but I know there's something more important for me. There's something greater for me that I look forward to, but I can't imagine what it's like. I've walked into a, you know, we walk into a house that, wow, we get to live in now, maybe not own, but to live in. It's great. It's amazing. It's going to fit our family. It's awesome. But I couldn't imagine the feeling, I don't know, I, I can't say I understand that, of walking into your own home. Actually purchasing something, buying it, and walking in. It must be a great feeling, right? Or maybe not. Or it's like, oh no. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, it's like, I got 30 years of this, right? Whatever it is. Or the day that you actually purchased your home, the final payment, some of you have been there. What a feeling that is, right? It's got to be amazing that it's no longer earnest, like it's actually fulfilled. He is the guarantee, the earnest, the Holy Spirit, the earnest of our inheritance. He's the down payment. The gift of the Spirit is viewed as an installment as a, or as a part of our salvation. The Holy Spirit not only guarantees our inheritance in Jesus Christ with His seal, but also with His pledge. He literally, believers are assured and guaranteed with an absolute certainty that only God could provide. The Holy Spirit is the church's irre irrevocable pledge, promise, her divine engagement ring. Because in that, in that setting, you would also find this pledge was also used in the same way as a form of the word even came to be used for an engagement ring. <laughs> oh man, God's put his ring on you. The Holy Spirit is like an engagement ring. Is that not we've been betrothed? We've been betrothed to another. You're walking in life. You're all engaged. Now, guys, I know you don't like it, okay? Just got to get over it. You're engaged. 
you, you, you got a ring on, you're waiting to be married. And we make it in the world we live in. So, no, it's beautiful. God is waiting for his bride, his purchased possession, what he gave his life and blood for, his only begotten son for. He's waiting for us to meet him at the altar and to fulfill that, and to fulfill that engagement, that period, the consummation of our marriage. He's waiting for that day, the marriage supper of the Lamb. So the Holy Spirit is the church's irrevocable promise, her divine engagement ring, as it were, that as Christ's bride, she will never be neglected or forsaken. God therefore assures the Christian that the realization of the rest of his salvation is forthcoming. How long is the believer? See, I, have a pro- I don't know if you really enjoy this or not. Like, if you're walking with God, this is like, this is meat. I mean, this is deep, like, deep, good, sitting on the bone, like, just rib meat. Like, you're just chewing gnawing on it. Some of you are like, I hope to God, if you're, not, if you're not enjoying this and you're not soaking this in, you need to go home and get right with God. I'm just going to be honest. Like, I'm not saying you have to enjoy it, but like, if you're missing like, the depth of your sealed, the security, the affirmation that God gives you, God therefore assures the Christian that the realization of the rest of his salvation is forthcoming. How long is the believer assured of his salvation? Until the redemption of the purchased possession. You go ahead and get ready, Adam, you guys. Until the redemption of the purchased possession. One says it like this, until God glorifies and, perf- perf- and perfects the believer, the purchased possession, in whom he has bought by Christ's blood. You are good, you are sealed until God glorifies and perfects you. And when does that day come? He says, until the, until the redemption of the purchased possession, until for the praise of his glory. One day, God is getting his possession. You are sealed. You've been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. You've been signed, you've been sealed, and you will be delivered. You've been signed, you've been sealed, you will be delivered. It's as good as done. Nobody can break God's seal. I don't know if you're struggling in your salvation, and I'll finish with this. I say this all the time. You know this, church. If you're sitting here and you're concerned about your salvation, just let a man to the Lord and he may be watching, he knows I'm not going to say his name and he may reveal that or allow me later, but this is just the first of many that I have ever, like that I've witnessed to. Some of you today need to be saved, you do. There's never been a time in your life that you've never truly been saved. You went to church you may become a tarot for a long time. You've said, you prayed something, but there is no fruit in your life. There is nothing in your life that would display that you're a Christ follower. And I know you probably sit here and you're like, well, I, I don't know. I, mean, I know I'm saved. I feel bad about stuff. As I talk with this gentleman and many others, many in this room have got saved because you're scared of hell. And you've heard me say that, church. I don't know why God has impressed me. Jesus didn't come to save you from hell. He came to save you from your sin. The Bible never says hell separates you from God. He says your iniquity has separated you from your God. Your sin has separated. You hear all the time Jesus says your sin. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Not for all are going to hell and come short of the glory of God. There's many people in Christianity, I don't know why today, maybe it's you. That there was a time in your life, yeah, I remember praying like, This man and many others who have said, yeah, I remember when I was a little kid, I went to my parents and I always asked them, I said, why'd you run to your parents or remember, why'd you get saved? Because I didn't want to go to hell. Is that why we get saved? Because I didn't want to go to hell? Now, not wanting to go to hell could lead me to the understanding that I'm a sinner, amen? But if the point of salvation, you don't understand you're a sinner, you're just scared to hell and there was never a conviction of sin, and there was never a reality of sin in your heart and your mind, as Romans 10 says, and Romans 9 talks about that, that you don't understand you're a sinner, but I just, I didn't want to go to hell, so I remember praying, didn't go, no, 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 you missed it. True salvation takes place when a woman, boy, girl, or child, whatever, understands their need of a Savior. Their need of a Savior is not because they're going to hell. Their need of a Savior is because they have sin. Sin has separated you from God, not hell. Sin has separated you from God. Preachers, we do, we've done a, we do a good job preaching on hell, and I will preach on hell hot and heaven sweet, amen? I'll do it all day long, but at the end of the day, I'm not going to use hell as a motivation for salvation. 
Hell is a realization of not being saved, but it's not a motivation for salvation. Yes, if you're not saved, you will spend an eternity in a lake of fire one day apart from God. But he didn't come to keep you out of hell. He came to give you a relationship. He came to give you a relationship because of sin. And if you've never repented and put your faith and trust in Christ, if you've only been afraid of hell, and there's never was conviction and sorrow over sin within your soul and within your mind, I would say what the Bible says. You better test your salvation and see if you be of the faith. The Bible says, test your out your own salvation. See if you be of the faith. Ask yourself, do I really know? Do I know that I know? Or did I just cry over hell? Or did I really cry over sin? There's a difference because we live in a culture where it says, as long as you pray this prayer, Jesus, save me. Please keep me. I don't want to go to hell. Like the whole motivation was not because you're a sinner separated from God. The motivation was you didn't want to go to hell. There's a difference. There's a big difference. The Bible says iniquity has separated you. Your sin has separated you. I don't know who you are. I don't know what's going on. You could have been coming here a long time. We could be close friends. But at that point, right in that moment, you realize that you can't go back to that day when you got saved. You don't remember being convicted of sin. You just remember running to mommy and daddy or grandma and grandpa or the preacher and said, I, I don't want to go to hell. And there was nothing to do with sin. It was just not going to hell. And I would, based upon the authority of God's word, that's not salvation. That's not salvation. Salvation in the Bible is a clear understanding of being a sinner. Being understand what has separated you from God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all have trespassed. You need to understand that. And when you understand that, volitionally, you understand it mentally, it will connect. You trust. That's what he says, you trust. It's a belief system. You trust. It's the old Niagara Falls illustration. The guy who walked across. Everybody said, you want to see me walk across on the tightrope? They say, yeah. You want to see you take the wheelbarrow? And they're like, yeah. And they said, all right, somebody needs to get in. Nobody gets in. You got to put your faith in Christ and be willing to step out on faith and trust Him. With your gut, you got to believe Him, but with your heart, you got to understand it. I mean, with your mind, you understand it. Listen, I'm going to pray. You bow your heads and close your eyes. And I know the time. We're going to sing, but I told you I got to mind God. I just got to mind God. We got to mind Him. We, we don't got time for games. If you're sitting here and you say, Preacher, listen, I'm not sure. I know Christ is my Savior. I'm not sure I've ever prayed to really prayed because I was convicted over my sin. I, I think I just did it because maybe I was scared of hell or I was in an emotional, well, I, don't even, I don't ever remember truly being convicted and feeling guilty over my sin and understanding what I was before God. But in this moment, you know I normally don't do this church because it's not my prayer, anybody else's prayer. But if you're sitting here and say, preacher, that's me. I know I'm a sinner right here now. I understand it. I, I need to be saved because I'm a sinner. In your mind and your heart, it would be like this, God, I know and understand, I've heard it today, the word of truth, and I want to trust in your saving grace. I want to ask you to forgive me and cleanse me. I repent of my sins, I turn from them, turn from my unbelief, and I'm turning towards belief and believing and trusting on you to forgive me and save me. Not unsure, unsure not real sure of all, everything goes on, but God, I do know one thing, that I'm a sinner that I need you for my forgiveness of my sins and my unbelief. Would you save me and forgive me and cleanse me today? Listen, if that's you and you're sitting here and you're like, yeah, I prayed that. I believe on Jesus. I trust in him as my savior. Don't mind, don't worry about nothing else. Just mind the spirit of God. Let's walk in the spirit. If that's you and you just look up at me, look back down so I can pray for you. That's awesome. That's so awesome. Thank you. Anybody else say, that's me? Thank you. Man, that's awesome. If you'll stand with us, we'll close in a song and we'll be done. Father God, those who have been saved and those you're dealing with, God, would you help them to reach out? Lord, love to walk with them, show them, make sure, affirm their salvation. If there's one in here, Lord, who's just been far from you, God, and they're just callous in their walk. They're just numb to the Spirit. Lord, help us to do business with you. Help us to honor you and bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Sing with this and we'll be done. If you need to come to the altar, you come to the altar. If you need to talk to somebody, you come talk to somebody.
dismissed in prayer. Adam, will you close in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for a good service, Lord. I thank you for the freedom we do have with everything going on in our country, God. We, we are still so grateful that we're here in the church service with the freedom to worship without fear of persecution. God, I pray that we'll take the message today. We won't just leave it behind, but we'll carry it through our week. God, if we truly are saved and we truly are sealed, give us the motivation and the drive to witness to those at work, to witness to those that we run into the store, God. Let us magnify your name. God, I pray for everyone's week, and I pray for safety travels home. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't forget the giving buckets in the back and children downstairs. Don't leave them here. Don't go home without them. Listen, we're good. We, I don't need extra. We're good. Thank you. Y'all have a great week.